open in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to continue this study that we've been on for the past six weeks. This is week seven. Next week is week eight. And then we'll be diving into our study through Colossians, which I can't wait for that. The countdown has begun. The books are being finished up and they'll be here soon. And uh, if you'd like to lead a small group of men or women or open up a home group, we would love to have more of those available and need to have more of those available for this season so that people can jump in. So would you really pray about that and consider that? And uh, if you're interested in doing a men's group, you can call the church office and get a hold of Danny, Pastor Danny. If you're interested in leading a women's group, you can call the church office and they'll connect you to Kara, whose birthday's tomorrow. Don't forget that. And uh, if you're interested in leading a home group, Pastor Mike is the one that you want to talk to. And so if you call the church office during the week or email us or whatever, we'll get you connected. But would you really prayerfully consider that? And uh, I think in light of this morning's message, even I'm hoping that God will stir up our hearts along those lines because it's a big part of our vision of how we do church, the small groups, meeting together in ways that enable us to connect and use our gifts in a different setting. And so I don't view the small groups as sort of an additional peripheral uh, beneficial thing. I think they're vital and integral to the life of our church and the things and the work that God wants to do. So consider jumping into those, consider maybe even leading one of those. And um, we're actually gonna be talking this morning about meeting with God's family. We're going through this book just for starters. Well, hopefully you're going through it. Hopefully you all have one and you're looking through that. Um, But we're using this outline as a series called Foundations, just looking at the foundations of what we believe As Christians, going over those again together, we're hoping that these studies and this booklet will provide an explanation for what we believe as Christians, that it will equip us all because every new believer that we get to see come to Christ, we give one of these and we tell them, hey, find someone that you can go through this with. And we never told you that that was our strategy. And so we wanted to equip the church to be prepared and able to take someone through this book in order to ground them and establish them in their faith. So we want every single one of you to be equipped to do that. And how many of you think it would be a joy to have the opportunity to do that? Cool, like a third of you. The rest of you, we need to talk. I don't know that there's more of a joy than to lead someone to faith in Christ and to be able to have the opportunity to see them established in their walk. That's what it's all about, by the way. Disciples making disciples. We, as disciples of Jesus, discipling others. And so um, I hope you would consider that a joy. It wasn't a trick question. And I hope that through this series you'll be encouraged. I hope that there'll be great explanations for what we believe, that you'll feel equipped to do that, and uh, also that we would come with expectation. That was what we were hoping would happen through this series, just to see what God would do and what we would get to be a part of. I wanna show you this graphic we've been looking at of the house, and it kind of gives us a sense of where we have been and where we are and what we have left. The first week, we talked about the truth, and that was just kind of our way of introducing ourselves to the idea that we can all agree on together of how life works. It's grounded on the truth, built on the foundation of the gospel in scripture. And we looked at trusting in God, being saved by God, living God's way, listening to God. And then last week, Danny did an excellent job uh, inviting us to consider prayer and talking to God because now we're up in the house, right? No one just... No one lives on a cement slab, right? Do any of you live on a cement slab? No, there's there's walls and there's a home and there's furniture and decoration and there's there's a family that lives inside and and that's kind of what we're getting up to now as we talk about meeting with God's family and meeting the world is this life that we live based on the foundation that's been built for us. 
It's so important to consider what it means to live out this Christian life because that's where our enjoyment of what God has given to us comes in. See, you can have the most beautiful home, the most uh, solid structure of a foundation and be miserable in life. Did you know that? Do you know that there's a lot of people that have beautiful homes that are thousands of square feet and have all of the bells and whistles, but they're miserable people? Because the life that they live is not according to God's design. And so it's not just the things that, that we believe, but it's the way that we live together built on that basis of what we believe. And so in a sense, you could say, it's what we do with what God's done for us that allows us to enjoy this life because God wants us to live together in this home and on this foundation. And so today, again, we're talking about meeting with God's family as a foundational part of the Christian life. And I just, I want that just to sink into our minds again because again, some people I think have begun to view or maybe always viewed church and our life together as sort of an optional thing, an additional thing for, for people that like it. But according to scripture, it's, it's actually foundational and vital to the life that God has called us to live. And so we're gonna look together at Hebrews 10 and verse 24 and 25. And uh, would you read along as I read out loud to you uh, from these verses in the letter to the Hebrews. It says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Would you pray with me? Father, would you help us to consider what you're saying and speaking to the church. Give us ears to hear. Thank you, Lord, for these people that have gathered in this place, Lord, your people, your family. More and more, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see things the way that you see it. And I thank you, Lord, that we could be together to consider these things now in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna start with a confession which may seem like a weird place to start for a pastor, but here we go. A confession that this is a text that pastors love for probably the wrong reasons. Don't neglect meeting together. How many of you have ever heard a sermon before in church on this passage? If I've heard 10 sermons on this text, they've probably all been Negative, because the temptation for a pastor when you come across this particular text is that this is my opportunity to hammer people on going to church. And so there's a temptation in this text. I could feel it all week preparing for this message that, man, the low-hanging fruit on this topic would be to point out all the statistics of how people are becoming less and less frequent in their church attendance and just, you know, to hammer on that point. But, but the funny thing is that temptation misses the heart of the text altogether. Because I don't know if you noticed it when we read it, but Paul said, when you gather together, don't neglect gathering together, as is the habit of some, it's true. But he says, when you gather together, encourage each other. And so I just want you to know that I'm going to be fighting the temptation <laughs> through this text to do what's so easy to do as a pastor and use this as a biblically backed basis for complaining about why people don't go to church, because you're here anyways, right? The people that need to hear that aren't here, so we'll, we'll tell them later on. But you're here, and I wanna encourage you, and we're here, and so I'm really challenging myself to resist that temptation. I'm hoping that we'll all leave here today encouraged, because that's the real heart of this text. And in reality, specifically what Paul says that we should do is that we should consider each other. 
that we shouldn't neglect gathering together, but we should come together. And as we come together, what we should do is we, can, we should consider one another, which means just very simply that we should think about each other on purpose. Think about each other on purpose. I love the dictionary definition of consider because there's this progression that I see when I was looking it up. It, it starts off with this definition, to think about and be drawn toward, okay? Then to regard something as having a specific quality or value. Then to believe in it, and think about it, to take into account when making assessments and to look attentively at. I, I'd love for you to consider what it would mean to consider what consider means as it regards church, okay? That we, when it comes to church and our gathering together, we would think about it and we would be drawn to it. And as we're drawn to gather ourselves together, that we would regard church, our gatherings, as having a specific quality or value. And I just want you to think as, as we walk through this step by step, do you regard, do you think about this gathering as having a specific quality or value? You probably do because you're here. But what is that value? There, there's a lot of ways that we could define it, but how Paul defines it in his letter to the Corinthians is, you know what this is right here? This is the body of Christ. And so as much as we would wish, man, I wish I could live in the days of Jesus' disciples when he was like standing right there, you know, when you could like shake his hand, hear his voice. I wonder what his voice was like. Look into his face. Man, how cool would it, would it have been to see Jesus in the flesh, right? But it, the Bible says the most amazing thing that when we gather, we should regard this as having that quality. Here is the very body of Christ. We should value it in that way. The amazing thing is that if you think about the body, your body, your body can do without a hand, right? It's a bummer. <laughs> you can do without a hand, but you know what your hand can't do? Without a body. And so when Parts of the body are missing. It's a bummer because the body is missing valuable pieces and parts that God has designed to be fit together as his body. But you know what's even worse about it is when we isolate ourselves and when we don't regard the body as having value, we don't survive spiritually. We think we do, but the fact is that we don't. There is a great, vital, life-giving, spiritual value in coming together and being together as the body of Christ. And we really, as we consider that, we wanna believe that. And, and as we think about that, we wanna take it into account. I love this. When it comes to assessing other things in our lives, other opportunities, other priorities, do we take into account the body of Christ in those decisions? Is the gathering of God's people and God's family a priority in our assessment of those other things? It should be. That's what it would mean to consider one another, is to assess the other things that we do and the other things that we have in life in light of the priority of being a part of God's family and the way that he's called us to gather together, not to neglect our gatherings but to be faithful and to be committed to it and then to look attentively as we do. The author of Hebrews says we should consider this and we shouldn't neglect this as he says has become the habit of some. It's an easy habit to slip into, to begin to neglect gathering ourselves together and to really considering the body of Christ in this way. And so my question for us this morning is do we make it a habit to think about people around us. Because as most good habits go, you have to be intentional. You have to be purposeful. It's not just gonna happen. And Paul wants us to consider 
to, to make it a habit to think about the people around us. He says in Philippians 2 that we should do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's, that's a powerful phrase, isn't it? Do you count other people more significant than yourself? Does that come naturally to you? <laughs> it doesn't to me. What comes really naturally to me is to count myself more significant than everyone else. But Paul says that as we gather as the family of God and with the spirit of God, we begin to consider others even more significant and to let, he says, each one of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Isn't this part of why it becomes so easy to neglect the gathering? Because we have our own interests. We have our own burdens and we think, man, I can't get involved in everybody else's stuff. I got my own stuff. My plate is already full. My hands are already full. But this is the heart and the mind that God has called us to have as his family. Well, what stands in the way of this? Paul says two things there in Philippians 2, selfish ambition and conceit. Selfishness, not being able to consider others above ourselves or to put others' interests above our own is what keeps us or causes us to begin to neglect the priority of gathering together as God's family. And conceit, what does that mean? I don't need this, I don't need you. <laughs> I'm good on my own. I got everything I need. I'm all good. That's a conceited way of thinking that God wants to correct in us. Paul, again, in Corinthians, as he's laying out that illustration of the body, he says, no part of the body can say to another part, I, have, I don't need you. Because there's all these different functions and, and none of us is the body as a whole. We need the other parts to do things and in ways that God will work through that he doesn't work in us on our own. There's other giftings, there's other graces, there's, there's other things that God wants to do and they only really happen when we're faithful to come together as the body. And, and Paul says something really interesting here because he doesn't just say consider, but specifically he says, I want you to consider, this is back in Hebrews 10, I want you to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. That's what I want you to do when you gather together. I want you to think about when you gather together how you can stir one another up. It's a really interesting word because if you look at other translations of the Bible, it's never translated the same way in English because we're searching for the right English word that gives the expression of the original language. Sometimes it's, it's translated motivate, stir, like in the ESV, spur, like that little pokey thing that you put on your heel to poke a horse to get it going. Sometimes it's even used to say something stronger like provoke, or even to describe a sharp disagreement. Like in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement. It's such a strong and interesting word because it conveys strong emotions, but here's, here's why it's so interesting to me. This idea of when you gather together, consider how to stir and spur and provoke and motivate each other. It, it, it has a positive and a negative connotation. But it's strong either way. It, it's the word that Paul uses in Corinthians in describing love when he says love is not easily provoked. But here, the author of Hebrews uses it in a positive way. Provoke one another to love and good works. So what's the picture? Why am I, why am I hammering on that? Because I think what happens when we really do this People get provoked. And the reason I want to consider that this morning is that's the reason people start to neglect gathering. Well, I was poked by that. I was provoked by it. I didn't like the way that that made me feel. That's how it's supposed to work. Because otherwise, what we do is we get comfortable and we become complacent and we don't grow. 
And so God has this design that when we get together, he actually wants us to get up and rub against each other, not literally, but in a figurative way, and, and in a way that will be close enough that we start to step on each other's toes and provoke each other, and it's like, uh, and, and just think about it. This is the very reason that we are often tempted to neglect the gathering, because we don't like that feeling. When you take something that's a mixture and you let it settle, what happens naturally? It separates, right? So what's the author of Hebrews say? You gotta stir it up. You gotta mix it up. You gotta provoke people. You gotta sometimes even sharply disagree with each other. Why? Because sometimes you'll walk away and God will use that to stir you up to love and good works. Sometimes you'll be meeting with a group of guys and a guy in the church will get in your grill about something you're saying about your wife and you're like, hey, I don't like that. And I'm not going to the small group next week because I didn't like how that guy talked to me and I can do whatever I want, but don't you think it's a good thing that you be stirred up to love your wife the way that God has called you to? Don't you know that that doesn't happen when you're on your own doing your own thing? And, and here's the little secret. I'm gonna provoke you right now. Some of you know that and that's why you stay away. I like doing my own thing. I like having it my own way. But God says, you're not gonna grow that way. You're not gonna grow as, as my family in my house by going in your separate rooms and closing the door and being on your own device. Don't we hate that as families? So how do we grow? To love and good works, it's when we gather around the table, when we talk about things, when we get involved in each other's lives, and yeah, sometimes it gets messy, and sometimes we get provoked, and sometimes we sharply disagree, but at least we're getting stirred up. Man, there's so much opportunity for God to work in that. It's interesting because when you talk about love and good works, people get provoked. When you talk about good things in the church, people get provoked. You talk about serving. You talk about tithing, giving. You talk about these good works that God has called us to do. And what happens? Half of the people go, well, that was legalistic. That was a guilt trip. People get provoked. And Paul says, the author of Hebrews says, this is what's supposed to happen when we come together, that we would consider, and, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we're just to be rude and cranky and just saying flippant things to tick people off. That's Facebook, okay? <laughs> this is church family. So we're not just spouting off insensitively but we're also not afraid to stir it up a little bit and to consider how we can do that so that we don't become complacent. Again, this is why the small groups and the way that we gather is so, so crucial and so important, I think, for the vision that we have to be God's family and to gather together. And people that study it, by the way, and I want to throw this out there, they say that, you know, a small group should really ideally stay together about 24 months and be about six to 10 people. Because anything more than that number is hard to consider and keep track of who's who. People just start coming and going and they're more anonymous and it's harder to consider them personally. And anything longer than that, people begin to become really comfortable. And I want you to consider this if you've been in a small group for a long time with the same people, whether or not that stirring is really happening. Or whether you've become so comfortable with the guys that you meet with or the gals that you meet with or the home group that you meet with that, that that's not really happening anymore. Maybe God wants in this season to mix it up. Maybe he wants to stir us up because he has good things in store for us as his family. The value of our gatherings is the valuing of God and one another. 
That's what we're saying when we gather together and don't neglect being the family of God. People so many times want to evaluate the value of a church service by the music or the message or this or that or, you know, what did I get out of it? And that, those aren't bad things, but ultimately, those aren't the criteria by which we decide whether or not we're going to gather together. We gather together because we say, quite practically, we value God and we value one another. And so it says in Acts chapter 2 that they devoted themselves to continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, prayer, breaking of bread, and fellowship, being together. They were devoted to that. God wants us to be devoted to that too, and it's foundational to the Christian life. Well, to close, what I want to do is I want to look at a picture of what this looks like in the Gospel of John. So if you would turn over to John chapter 9, I want to look at this with you. What would it look like for us to consider one another, to provoke one another, to be stirred up to love and good works when we gather? What would it look like? And I think what it would look like is what it so often looked like in Jesus' life, right? It's a pretty safe way to illustrate the point, to hold up the life of Jesus and say, here's who we're following. Here's hopefully who we're wanting to become more like. So what would it look like? What did it look like for Jesus to consider others and to even at times provoke others? Watch this in John chapter nine, verse one. It says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva, and he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he's like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. And I'll stop there. The story goes on. But I just want you to think about this story with me for a minute and see the very things that we're talking about illustrated powerfully in the life of Jesus. Jesus sees this blind man and considers him. Now, it may be just a slight detail in verse one, but I don't want you to miss this because it says, as Jesus passed by, he was on his way somewhere. And if you read the verse before, you know that he's not just casually walking around. Do you know what Jesus is doing at this point? He's running for his life <laughs> because he was just in the temple ticking off the religious people and it says that they were picking up rocks to kill him. And so he's getting out of there, and it says, as he passes by. Now, I want you to think about if you were running for your life, would you stop to help somebody? Do you see how considerate Jesus is? It makes me think, how many people do I pass by because I think I have something important to do? Not usually running for my life. I want you to know if I'm running for my life, I probably won't stop to help you. <laughs> 
No offense. But how many people do I miss so that I can check another box in my favorite productivity app? Jesus, even though he's running for his life, considers, he stops, he pauses, he sees this man in need. And he heals him in the most bizarre way, right? He spits on the ground and makes mud and smears it on his eyes and tells him, go to the pool of Salem. Remember what this guy's problem is? He's blind. Now he has to walk with mud in his eyes and spit, which is fine because he can't see anyways, but he has to go from where he's at, most likely all the way across the busy inner city of Jerusalem, which if you've ever been to is a maze, even if you can see. But he's got to make his way all the way there. Jesus considers the man and heals the man, and what does it do? Does it provoke some people in the story? Which is amazing. He heals a blind man, and all these people can think of is, well, did he break one of the Sabbath rules? We need to investigate this. And I think it reminds us, as we gather as the family of God, I love what Chuck Smith used to say before he passed away, and And please understand the heart of what I'm about to say. He said, you know, as the church, there's these different roles, but as the church, we need more paramedics and fewer policemen. No offense to policemen. I'm so grateful for our policemen and women that serve, and there's even several of them here this morning. But but do you know what I mean? When, when the police show up, they're trying to figure out where the bad guy is, who did something wrong, if there's a crime that needs to be charged, right? What does the paramedic do? They're not worried about any of that stuff. They just know we gotta stop the bleeding. And as the church, when we gather as God's family, that, that's the heart to consider one another like Jesus considers this blind man and yet the very thing that it says in Hebrews would happen happens because people are provoked. The disciples even are asking, who sinned? Why is this guy blind? Was it him or his parents? I mean, what kind of sin would this guy have to have committed in the womb to deserve blindness? What kind of sin can you even commit in the womb? But that's their question. They're asking all the wrong questions. Who's wrong? Who can we blame? Why did this happen? Instead of asking, what does God want to do? Jesus considers the man. He heals the man. It provokes the people around him because God wanted to do a work. God wanted to take this man who the other people wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole and make him a display of the power and the grace of God. I was thinking about that, a 10-foot pole. And I found a 10-foot pole in the back of the church this morning. This is a 10-foot pole. Did you know that sometimes we neglect the gathering because there's people that we say, I wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole. (laughs) How messed up does somebody have to be that you wouldn't even touch them from this far away with a pole? (laughs) Right? God wants us to consider each other, to put down our poles, to not worry about getting our hands dirty, to roll up our sleeves as the family of God and get close enough to get into each other's messes and to really lift each other up. And so here we are this morning gathered as the family of God. And I want to encourage us. Keep showing up. Keep considering each other. Join a small group. Lead a small group. Lean into what God is doing. Stir one another up to love and good works. Don't forsake gathering together. And I love what it says in our text. More and more... 
as you see the day approaching. More and more, let's let God work this heart in us. Would you pray with me?